Welcome to Proteo Conversations, the podcast where leadership in business and accounting isn't just discussed, it's explored. I'm your host, Zane Stevens, and thank you for joining me as we delve into the minds of some of the most influential leaders in the industry. Our journey is one of discovery, from unraveling the unique stories that shaped our guests' careers to the invaluable advice that fueled their success. We are here to provide you with simple, actionable advice to accelerate your career and personal growth. Whether you're a budding professional or a seasoned executive, these conversations are designed to offer insight and perspective that resonate with everyone. So tune in, engage, and be inspired as we build better leaders together. Welcome to Proteo Conversations. Today we're speaking to Andrea Christensen of principal of h and Christian Company, the insurance agency her grandfather started in 1923 in San Anselmo, California. That's correct, over a hundred years ago. Crazy. She's the third generation to carry on the business, and her daughter, Janelle, who is her right hand, brings four generations to the agency. Extremely special operation. Andrea's career has spanned over more than 30 years, providing service to her clients, many of whose families have been with the agency for generations as well. Her vast experience, understanding of the current insurance climate, and commitment to education set her apart from her peers. She calls herself an insurance nerd, and enjoys monthly classes to keep abreast of continued changes in the coverage provided by the insurance policies she sells. A lifelong resident of Marin and Sonoma counties, Andrea enjoys traveling with her husband, John, time outside in her vegetable garden, water skiing, spending time with her family and friends. And personally, I think Andrea is just the most amazing person around. So Andrea, welcome to Proteo Conversations. Zane, thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's a great opportunity to speak, and I feel like it's really good timing. I know 2023 was the official 100 years, but you know, before we get into our regular questions, I'd just love to hear a little bit more of how does it feel? <laughs> I was surprised at my reaction. Uh, it was humbling, uh, emotional, gratifying, and uh, wishing that I had a, a father or grandfather that could uh, really see this in person. Uh, but knowing, you know, somehow we have to believe that our family members who go before us are are here somewhere alongside us. And the overwhelming part was the response of many of my clients uh, who had glowing things to say about us, fond memories of uh, my father, one fond memories of my grandfather, and to be able to talk about it, to be able to celebrate it with clients, to be able to have my peers such as you and other business people I know really remind me what an amazing feat this was, has been a, a fabulous feeling. And I was not prepared for my emotional reaction to it, uh, but I'm blessed. I'm truly blessed. And I'm not sure what goal we'll put on this, on this business for our next celebration, but I hope that uh, as Janelle moves in behind me, we can continue and say, okay, do we get to at least 125 and, and where do we go from here? No, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, I always sort of sit back and go, do I want my count my kids to be accountants one day? And I'm like, probably not. So it's incredible that a family has been able to sort of just push it through the generations. And it's, it's it's amazing to see. I mean, there's not that many hundred year businesses out there. Um, and I, I'm very thankful to know you and I know that you guys do great work. You heard all, all the great work that your clients send and all the testimonials that you receive. So congratulations. And uh, I look forward to seeing what, what the future brings. Thank you so much. So let's get into it. Okay. Tell us about this journey from at some point you left high school and then decided, let me get into the insurance world. So, so tell us all about that story and how you got started. When you, you know, when you said not, you know, how do you want your kids to be uh, accountants? Uh, I don't think there is a child grow, who grows up who says, I want to be an insurance broker. Maybe not even, I want to be an accountant either. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously when it's in your family and it's in your blood, uh, you view things differently. And I realized at a really young age that I liked helping people. Um, but insurance allows you to combine intelligence, knowledge, experience, along with helping people. And so I think that that just really met my personal needs. Um, but being in San Anselmo to start 
uh, when I would go and work. I think I told you on a Saturday morning when my father would say, I'm going to go to work for a few hours and uh, you're coming to help clean the office. Uh, and it wasn't an option. This is what you did when a family business uh, was was functioning. And so I started going and then I started going in the summertime and that's where I would work. And then I'd go to school and then I'd come back and I'd be working there. And I got to meet um, this amazing community. And that is what I think drives many businesses, even though we have expanded uh, all of us, our ability uh, first by fax, then by emails to work with businesses that are not in our backyard. Um, but all of these people that I met, many, many, many of the business owners all did business with each other. And it was this commitment, the knowledge, the experience, and the understanding that these people with whom I have relationships are my clients. I am also their client. And so they built a wonderful community. I saw that exemplified through Rotary International, which I was exposed to really early, but also now I see it in our provisors groups. We know each other, we know who to call, and it's not always just to do business. It may be, hey, I just ran into this, have you ever heard of it? Can you tell me how this is going to work? So I really got to see how uh, running a business in a small community, running a small business, staying close to your friends, uh, even your competitors, uh, how you can all help each other and how you can grow. And and again, I, I did not think this is where I was going to go. Uh, I quit a couple times. <laughs> One time my father just and I just didn't do well. And I said, that's it. I'm out of here and um, took a week off and ended up back working for him again. And, and we worked things out. Uh, but being with your family in a business is not always easy. Uh, High, high, high expectations were set for me. Uh, my father always set high expectations for himself and really passed that on to his children. And so when I was at the office, it was perfectionism was expected. But I have enjoyed that journey and I, I just stayed. I, I kept going different places and then coming back, um, worked different small jobs, uh, but never have really worked anywhere else and then became fascinated with, as I said to you, when I be realized I was an insurance nerd, fascinated with the actual wording and policies, what this really means and how important it was to have our clients really understand an insurance contract. That's incredible. So I mean, basically your whole career has been at the same firm. It has. And uh, when about did you take over from, from your father? When did that transition take place? Uh, I took over from my father in the late 80s. I, uh, he, he was unwell and uh, I had a, a couple of young children. And um, <laughs> in, during that time, all of his staff except one were uh, older men. And um, he had had a heart attack and I went back to work. I had been off for a short period of time after one of my children were born. And the staff kind of all looked at me like, we're going to take instructions from this young female, no less in a male dominated industry. Uh, and I, I said to all of them, look, I may know not still know a lot about insurance, uh, but I have to do this. I have to figure out how to run this business. And Zane, it was one of the uh, learning times for me that was really important. There were some people that worked for uh, the accountant that my father had used forever. And the bookkeeper came and showed me how to look at the books that are specific books, you know, not just knowing accounting, but how to look at our books. This is what you have to earn each month. This is how, what this means. This is what payroll taxes are. This is how all this works. I hadn't done any of that part of the business. And uh, there were two other insurance brokers who were in San Insumo who came after they left their office and would meet with me and say, this is what you need to look at on this account. This is how you have to handle this. And then there were the clients themselves who said, oh, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. We're here. We have your back. <laughs> and, and I didn't know what I didn't know, which was probably a really good thing because I just thought I could do this. Uh, the staff was an interesting challenge. And I had a mentor who has now passed away, and I don't even know if she knew she was a mentor. Uh, but she said to me one time at a Rotary meeting, 
you know, it's a bigger feather in your cap to keep people as employees than to send them away, let them go. So I worked really hard to figure out how to work with the staff that we had, how to make that work for both of us and be beneficial to both of us. Um, later on, when dad completely retired, uh, I had always, I have always had staff that stay 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, our last bookkeeper who retired was with us for 30 years. So there's been a long, long-term relationship with many of our staff. And I really, really would tell you that the motivating factor is to try to make sure that we're kind and treat them well. And that's a word you know very well. Yeah, I always tell my, my team that um, I'm trying to develop a cult. I want them to come in and spend the rest of their lives with us. Yes. Uh, I know it's not always possible, but that's the environment that I'm trying to create. And it seems like you're, you sort of have the same values towards maintaining long-term relationships. Yeah, it is. It's really important. And I, and I think not just with your, your, your staff, but, but with your clients, all that applies the same way. Yeah, totally agree. So tell us a little bit, what does the day to day of a principal of an insurance agency look like? What do you do on a daily basis? You know, I was thinking about that when you asked me, I answer questions all day long. <laughs> I either answer questions of staff, questions from clients, my own questions, questions from underwriters, uh, or I'm asking questions. Uh, I, I always try to start my early day uh, with some positive affirmations. Uh, and then when I get to the office, um, I make certain that those clients that have reached out to us with questions, because that is questions, have had their questions answered, uh, their needs are taken care of. I'm very fortunate that our staff all are very uh, customer oriented and really want to make sure we respond to everybody as quickly as possible when we have the answer. Uh, so I, I spend some time right away in the morning answering questions. Uh, I always try between noon and two, I am working on new business clients. So I try to structure my day that way. And then I am supposed to be working on my business uh, in the afternoon. I will be the first to admit that that does not always happen because I get caught in the weeds of mm -hmm. things that the clients need. Um, but it is, it, it is, I have found that if I structure my days into kind of two hour increments, that's how that ends up. But answering questions really is what I do most of all. And I love the fact that uh, I get to mentor staff who don't have as much experience. And I believe that their education is really, really important to their success and to being able to provide as much information as possible to our clients. So I spend a lot of time, again, answering their questions, but also showing them this is where you get that information. So I don't think I'm doing anybody any good at all to just give them the answer. This, this is how you find it. This is where you find it. This is why. This is who you need to talk to to get that answer. Um, and then late afternoon, as you know, uh, both being involved in ProVisors, I spend some time with ProVisors and uh, what I need to do to keep our group running uh, and answering questions for that. And then I usually try to head out to the pool after that, after the end of the day. I mean, that that's a lot. Obviously, what stands out there is the amount of questions that you're answering. It's a service-based industry, right? And you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you are effectively a customer service. You're the middleman between the, you know, the big, big insurance companies and those clients that really need your help. Uh, do you have a specific industry that you service? Is there a preferred client that you, you like to work with in the insurance world? Uh, nonprofit clients are my favorite and something I've done for a long time, something I think I can do well. What I enjoy most about serving nonprofit clients is that most of us have seen nonprofit entities work in our community and how effective they can be what uh, needed services they provide. Uh, I, the needed services they provide are uh, very clear in this day and age in all of our communities. And this can range from housing to uh, funding for other, other nonprofits 
to uh, social services, you know, the, the creations of nonprofits and who they serve are pretty amazing as more and more I get into them. But what I really enjoy most is that they know what they're doing for the community. They know what they do and they do it very well. They need someone who's going to help them with insurance because it, it is almost a foreign thing to them, uh, especially when they're first starting out. And they need to have a board of directors. So it's kind of guiding them saying, okay, this is the board. There's, how do you run a board meeting? We have insurance carriers that have um, myriad resources available to the nonprofit entities for free if they become clients through our office, uh, through this one insurance carrier. So they do a fabulous job of providing behind the scenes services, of, again, either at a discounted price or at no cost at all to the nonprofit entities. And when the nonprofit executive director is trying to wear many hats, uh, run, their, run their business, also figure out funding, also trying to figure out it, how we comply with all the requirements we have to have as either an employer or as a nonprofit, uh, they can use help. And if we can save them money uh, by offering them free resources when they still already have to pay for insurance, it feels like a win-win. So that that to me is the nonprofit area is really one that I truly enjoy. That's amazing that there's so many additional services and help that they can get out there. I mean, it feels like a crazy world. You know, I've just dabbled in a little bit myself from the accounting standpoint. And, you know, the biggest takeaway we have when we're working with them is they don't know where to get information. They don't know who to ask for information. And a lot of it falls on, on you know, their general service providers being us, their bookkeeper, their tax provider, uh, their attorneys, and I guess most importantly, which maybe some of them don't know, their insurance provider who can really help them out since there's some difficult situations. So that's that's some really good information. What I've taken from this, if you created yourself an amazing career, I'm I've seen it, I know it. You're a wonderful person as well, but I'm sure along the way there's been some difficulties. So are you able to just share with us some of your biggest challenges you've experienced, either personally or professionally, to get yourself from where you started to where you are today? You know, Zane, you, when I thought about this question, I, my mind immediately went to uh, my experience with Rotary International. I uh, was blessed to grow up in a family uh, in which my grandfather and father were members of the same Rotary Club of Ross Valley in San Anselmo. And if you fast forward to the late 80s, 1988, Rotary had to, at that time, they were told, you must allow women into Rotary. And there were none in the Rotary mm -hmm. Club of Ross Valley. And so the members kind of got together and started talking. And I, I am positive the conversation was, well, who's going to cause us the least discomfort being with us at a weekly meeting? Uh, and so I was one of the people they were considering, and then there was another woman they were considering. And uh, it is the same woman who gave me the advice about uh, uh, an employee. And so she said, you be the first member. Go ahead, you be the first member. So I joined the Rotary Club of Ross Valley in 1988. I became the first woman. The first thing that happened was I dropped the median age in half uh, because all of the <laughs> members were uh, seasoned gentlemen. And then uh, three men resigned. One who I had known, who had known me since I was born. Uh, our parents shared a duplex in, in, uh, in San Anselmo. And he just said, nothing personal. Women don't belong in Rotary. I'm out of here. Uh, so <laughs> here we go. Then the second part was they didn't know what to do with me. You know, what, what do we even have you do? Rotary has areas of service. And they said, well, we're going to assign you. Do you want to do something about... Um, do you want to deal with uh, the high school program that has Rotaract kids? I said, yes, but I also really am interested in what we call group study exchange. Zane, where that led was a fabulous 10-year run of um, being in charge of the group study exchange for what we call District 5150, which encompasses Marin County, uh, San Francisco area. Uh, for Rotary International and as many, many groups. I got to meet amazing people. And I learned that 
I didn't want to carry a big stick being a young female in a male dominated organization. I was going to do this just based on my pure love of community service, of wanting to be there and embodying the attributes of what Rotarians mean and saying, this is who I am. This is what I have to give, take it or leave it. And I started realizing that I kind of, uh, that I incorporated that in all that I did, you know, in business as well. And insurance was a male dominated industry. And I remember one of the clients saying oh, to his secretary, yeah, I'll talk to the kid if I have to. <laughs> and I talked to him and I had known him a long, long time. And I said, yeah, right now, this is who you have to talk to. And he and I ended up working well together. His, um, actually his granddaughter I now work with in their insurance. Uh, so it's, you know, it's that kind of thing that I took and I just, I, I'm not sure it was really conscious. Later on, it became conscious that I just decided I'm going to be who I am. I, I know what I'm doing. Uh, I know what I want to give in Rotary and I'm going to allow this to be a strength, not a weakness. So that was an interesting, it, that was just an interesting time uh, to now, as I look back at it, uh, I imagine some women really would have probably reacted a bit angrily or with frustration. And I just kind of went, it's their problem, not mine, and, and moved on. So that was interesting to overcome. I also think learning to, uh, learning to be careful in working with others within our agency and not, I, I don't want to micromanage. So how do I, as an employer, how do I not micromanage? How do I be respectful? Even if you make a mistake and do something wrong, how do I handle that? And it was always the exact same thing of how do you want, how would you prefer to be work handled? How would you like someone to treat you in this situation? Can we be kind? Can we find a way? And, and as a result, as I told you, we have long-term staff, but I also feel that my staff will say to me, okay, this is what happened. This is what I've done to fix it. Cause that's always my question. <laughs> How do we fix it? Um, and, and you're not, you know, you're not blaming, you're not making someone feel bad or human. So I think that realization that I wanted to deal with my staff in that same way, uh, was really important and, and an important learning time. And we have moved past uh, when employers, you know, you had to clock in at eight o'clock and if you were there at 8.01, you had to explain why. And your break is, you know, this time and your, your lunch hour is this time. And, you know, we, we've learned that we cannot hold people to this minute by minute standard. And again, that's human, that's being human. Uh, who knows what the traffic was like when you tried to run an errand? You know, most people are trying to work and take, keep their household together. How do they balance both? How do they, you know, how, how, at lunch or whatever time you might have, you're trying to go do something. And if you get stuck in traffic, you get stuck in traffic. You can't, for me, I chose not to make this uh, a big issue and rather treat people respectfully. So I think those types of things of, of, transitioning from a different way of looking at being an employer to how we look at it now and how, to me, how we really need to look at it now is important. You know, I've heard that story of yours from Rotary and it, you know, blows my mind because it's just a time that I don't know. Obviously there's still a lot of inequalities out there, but when I started my career, I worked for female partners, female boss, uh, you know, Rotary at the moment is, I think, mostly female, like 85% female. So right. it always just sort of blows my mind that that was a time that was an issue. And it, it's really hard for me to comprehend. Uh, and then my big takeaway just with dealing with people, it is tricky. And one of the big things when I started Proteo was this rigid arrive at this time, clock out at that time, just created so many bad habits because people were then just working towards a clock. And I would see when I had a big office and I could watch my team members at like 10 minutes before clock up, they're all basically sitting with their bags ready to go. And just, like, just go, go, who cares? Like, it's just 10 minutes. You've, I promise you, you've made it up somewhere along the line. And those of you who haven't, well, you know, maybe you won't be around for that long anyway. So it doesn't right. matter. You either love your job and you get it done. Um, but I also understand that nobody loves their job enough to give up their lives for it. So you got to just let people live as long as they get their job done. 
And, and I think that mutual respect is so important because I also know that it may be 515 if we're supposed to leave at five, that someone's packing up their desk exactly to your point. I wanted to finish this. You know, they're mm -hmm. not doing that if they're driven by a clock and, and, and they, they have the freedom to either 15 minutes either way, make things work or to even say to us as, as their supervisors, Hey, can I work this way? You know, can I, I work at this time tomorrow? I don't care. You know, I, I want your work to get done. I want you to talk to our clients. Uh, but we have, thankfully, we've moved on to being rigid. And, uh, you know, you talk about having kids in an office or grandkids in an office. And uh, I brought my son to work 31 years ago because uh, I had somebody quit just two weeks before he was born. And so my time off was very short. Mm -hmm. And that would have never happened. You know, a lot of, that just wasn't happening. So, and it was the best thing. That was another thing I learned. It was one of the best things I did for my staff. They loved coming to work. I, I get to mm. hold the baby for a half hour. <laughs> Go for it. So it really, yeah, it, it changes yeah. all the dynamics of, of an office. Yeah, great. So uh, we sort of touched on at the beginning that you're sort of still trying to figure out you, your next path, but do you have any short-term goals that you're you're working on at the moment that you'd like to share with us? I do. Uh, part of my short term goals are to have us continue to be able to s provide options for our clients in this difficult insurance market, which we're, we won't talk a lot about other than to acknowledge that 23, 24 uh, is looking, 24 is looking like it's continuing to be difficult in California and insurance. And that's not just California, by the way. Um, we're I, heard, in the I heard Florida is even worse. Exactly. Texas has some issues. So yes, uh, we are an independent insurance brokerage, which means we are able to represent many carriers. Some we have what we call direct appointments with others. Um, we access through wholesalers or middle middlemen, we'll call it. So we will have the, we do have the ability to offer many, many markets that Others, other brokerages may not. I want to continue to expand our accessibility to those markets so that we can serve more clients as this insurance landscape changes. And so that is one of the things that I try to do each day. I'm either reading articles, checking out, you know, I get lots of emails, check for in depth reading the emails to see what's available. So when I look at the next even two years, my goal is to increase our markets by at least 10 to 15 percent just so that we have accessibility and options for our clients the other day when i talked with someone and they said you know you must just be having an awful time with all these challenges i said but i also see that as, as opportunities we are able to write properties that others can't write because of the way we're positioned so we can write, we have carriers that are writing homeowners policies. We have carriers that are writing building policies. I didn't tell you it's cheap, but we can at least write them. So I think that, you know, the ability to have these markets available to us has positioned us in a, in as good a position as we can be during this difficult time. But my goal is to really improve what our options are so that we have more options for our clients as, as we see all these issues continue. I also um, will continue to press education with myself and my staff, which I talked a little bit about with you before, uh, but continuing to uh, read policies and have my staff actually understand what they're selling, which I think is kind of a lost art mm -hmm. in the insurance industry as I'm seeing things evolve after 30 some odd years. Uh, I want to continue to have the, edu the education piece and then acquire another agency. So that's been in the back of our mind and, and we have a few that we're talking with. Those are, they come and go, the opportunities come and go, uh, but that may come to fruition as well. So that we're excited about. So there's some exciting things to look forward to. Yeah, a lot of great things. And a big takeaway I would say there is a good insurance broker at the moment is not necessarily the cheapest. It's one that actually can do something. Uh, so if you're talking to insurance companies, price is important, but actually being able to get the policy done is probably more important in this current environment that we're dealing with. Can you share with us the best piece of advice that you received 
early on that's helped you being successful for such a, a sustained period of time? Understand what you're selling and communicate that well to your clients. And by understand what you're selling, it does mean read the policy. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you an example of not very long ago, I had a client who needed a specific type of coverage and uh, it involved pollution coverage. And I had three different quotes and I spent about three hours reading those three policies to understand the difference in what those were. One was fairly expensive, one was middle, and one was inexpensive. The inexpensive made me curious as to why it was so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. uh, the high, I'm like, okay, what are we getting? Uh, but I have spent years and years and years and years learning to read policies so that even the ability to do that for someone who is new to the industry, it's not going to be an easy task. Uh, but it's really important to me that we understand what we're selling. I try to really ask my staff to understand what these exclusions on a policy mean and discuss it with the client, ask the client to look at them, understand what they're purchasing, but then also to communicate that to you, which is really just asking more questions and saying, all right, this is this exclusion is on the policy. This is what it effectively does. Might you have a situation in which this could affect you? And trying to get the clients to really pay attention and understand, which is also why Zane, you know, when we say, yes, you can buy things online, I don't think there's any substitute for talking with an experienced, knowledgeable person about whatever you think you can purchase online. Uh, because there's so many issues and parts to an insurance policy that need to be considered. And that, that just cannot happen when you're doing it online. Yeah, that's great advice for anybody in the service industry and all my accounting people out there as well. You know, AI and automation is taking over. It's all over the place. Yeah. But really what differentiates AI and automation from a you know knowledgeable person is that experience mm -hmm. and understanding and the ability to have the conversations understand what you really need and give you the best solution. So fantastic that that, that is great advice. I, I, you know, I'm gonna take that one to heart myself and I think anybody listening to this should as well. Understand what you're selling and listen, communicate. It's all important stuff. Is there some advice that you sort of learned along the way that you wish you had received when you first started out? Yes learn to let go sooner if it's not working out well. I think all of us in business have had a client or a situation that we kind of knew at the back of our mind, either with the relationship with the person or the business or the situation you were in was not going to end well uh, and, or, and or be very trying or time consuming, expensive. Uh, and I am the person who, if I am contacted and said, can you help me with my insurance? I want to be able to do that. So I want to please, I want to offer solutions. I want to be their answer and their solution. And that doesn't always happen, but it takes a while to understand where we can be successful, how we can be successful, and when we might not be able to really help. So it's learning how to say, I don't think that this is going to be, that I'm going to have a good viable solution for you that is either going to be affordable or provide the correct coverage, or even in the case of the way I work with clients, I want it to be open communication on both sides. And if I'm not getting the information I need, how to be able to say, I, I need more information to effectively provide you with what you need and to benefit you and if I'm not getting that, then I'm not sure that we're a good fit for each other. But how do we say that? How do we say that in a way? How do we learn to say that? And I think experience is what allows us to do that and recognize that uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah, something I have to remind myself as well all the time. If that nagging voice in the back of my head is saying this is probably not going to work, I probably should listen to it. That's it's nagging me for a reason. You know, as the saying goes, but looks like a duck. It sounds like a duck probably is a duck exactly. <laughs> stay away from the ducks yes 
And and you're right that that sixth sense or intuition or gut feeling, whatever we call it, is there for a reason. And the sooner we listen to it, usually the better off we are. And 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 it's right most of the time. Agreed. So Andrea, you've gone through you've gone through some times, you know, the late eighties and all the uh, the men acting ridiculously. You've had to manage people with more experience and sort of different thoughts from you. You've, you know, run a very successful hundred year old insurance agency for a long time. So I know that you got some great advice to our listeners. And could you take a moment and just sort of share with us some of your best advice that you would give anybody that wants to be a better leader? What would that advice be? First of all, listen. Two ears and one mouth. I don't still always do that well, but try to actually listen, not just have someone speak, but actually hear what they have to say, respond. You recently uh, wrote an article about how do we communicate? And I said, we ask questions. How can I help you understand this? How can I help you succeed? What can I do to help you get through this time? Uh, check in with your staff. Are you overwhelmed? How are you doing? Uh, we, when we go back to some of the way managers used to work, of uh, you know, I don't want you standing around talking. Um, that's an important time as a manager, boss, employer to say, hey, how's everything going? How was your weekend? How was your birthday? How are the kids? How's your dog? Whatever it is, ask, listen, <laughs> pay attention. But also to communicate, and honestly, Zane, it, it sounds, you know, such a cliche. Don't sweat the small stuff. In five years, will this matter at all is a great way to look at things so that you don't get caught up in, in uh, some of the issues that may not be important at all and that you waste time. Um, and, and is this is this going to bring us to our goal and our bigger plans? And is this really good for me? And, and I think that when we run a business, sometimes we lose sight of me, who we are individually, and we can become workaholics very easily. And we forget that we have, uh, that we're a whole person, that there's family, and that there's other needs involved, not just running the business. And even though the business is who we are, part of who we are, it is only part of who we are. So, so really remember that uh, you can separate yourself from, from your business. And that's not easy. It doesn't mean that you're not invested fully in it, but it also means that you're learning to set a few boundaries to, to take care of yourself as well. That's great advice. Listen to understand care about your people and don't forget to be kind to yourself. Great advice. Exactly. So Andrea, let's take a couple of minutes. Let's learn a little bit more about you as a person. Can yeah. you tell us something interesting about you outside of the professional space that will give us a better picture of who Andrea is as a person? Did I tell you that I walked on water in, in Finland? No. <laughs> I will tell you that it was also frozen, but we walked across, uh, a body of water in Finland when I was a group study exchange leader for Rotary International. And my exchange was uh, with Finland and Estonia. And Estonia had just a few years prior to that uh, become independent. And so it was an amazing time to talk to people who had lived uh, in a completely different way of life uh, until we arrived there. Uh, so Rotary uh, opened huge doors for me, uh, gave me a lot of insight into the world and, and people uh, in the world. Uh, so I had fabulous exchanges, as I told you, 10 years of being involved directly with the exchanges and uh, young people and leaders coming from every country. Um, that's also, again, Zane, where <laughs> uh, my name being Andrea in Europe, it's also a male name, and they thought I was a man. <laughs> and so then when they got our group photo, we suddenly were disinvited to a number of group meetings that we were supposed to attend. 
<laughs> so when I look back at it now, it's fa fascinating. And I laugh now. Uh, so Rotary was, was, has been a huge part of me. Um, I was a rodeo queen and a horse, uh, we called it a horse association group queen. Uh, I grew up show, riding and showing horses, uh, which I still love to, to ride. And uh, that was a fabulous time of life. That is when I really learned that you win sometimes when you shouldn't and you lose sometimes when you shouldn't. So those were really good uh, life lessons. I remember one time my horse just behind the judge's back, just blowing up and misbehaving and the judge didn't see it. And I won the class and I was mortified because I knew I had no, that I should not win this. Uh, but it was an important lesson. You know, and so it gave me insight into when others win when they shouldn't. Oh, well, you just experienced that. So maybe they feel the same way. Uh, so I, I enjoy horses. Uh, as you said in our introduction, I, I enjoy traveling. And I enjoy, love, love, love being a mom and a grandmother. My three children have all um, finished school and are on their own and have uh, wonderful lives of their own. Uh, and that is what I had asked for, is to have, <laughs> I had asked all of them, finish school, be good people, be self-sufficient, and they've all done that. And uh, I have grandchildren and I'm blessed to have all them nearby. I get to see them a lot. And amazing groups of friends. So I'm, I am extremely blessed in my personal life and uh, with provisors. We just were talking uh, the other day about how that community of business associates become friends and people you know and admire and can call on. And that to me has been most gratifying. I, I spend time with my family, spend time with my friends. And I think that emotional health is more important than anything else you can, you can look at in your life. But it is a fun way to spend days. I craft with a group of friends. Uh, I work in my garden, as you said, and uh, right now we're redoing our kitchen. And so that's taught me some interesting things, <laughs> patience, most of all. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't always have it. Uh, but that, those are some of the things I enjoy doing. And, and then I, I stop at times and every once in a while, I'll look at my calendar and realize that, you know, three months has gone by and I haven't had a day that isn't booked with something and that I need to stop and take a day and allow myself to do nothing. And that's my greatest challenge is to allow myself to stop and just take a little downtime. Andrea, thank you so much for sharing with us. Absolutely amazing career. Can't believe that you guys are a hundred years old. That's quite the achievement. Thank you for all the wonderful lessons. Uh, part of conversations, we like to end with some rapid fire. So if you're ready, I have five questions for you and would love to hear your top of mind. Okay, number one, what is your dream vacation? Caribbean. Cruise or hanging out on the island? Sit on an island of white sand and sun and read a book and go in the water when they feel like it and do absolutely nothing. Sounds pretty good. Number two, do you prefer audio books or paper books? Paper. If you had 20 minutes to exercise, what would that exercise be? A walk or a run outside. Number four, what is your favorite piece of technology that you use to make your life a little bit easier or better? An electronic calendar. Some kind of calendar. And number five, our last question, what is your favorite childhood meal? Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. Thanks, Andrea. And with that, we end another Proteo Conversations. Thank you for joining us in the journey of learning and of learning and inspiration. Today, we've gained insights from our guests and taken another step toward understanding the diverse tapestry of leadership in business and accounting. Remember, each conversation is a step towards the positive transformation of business leaders. We hope our discussions has given you a valuable takeaway to apply to your own career and life. Don't forget to subscribe to Proteo Conversations on YouTube and Spotify so you never miss an episode. We'd also love to hear your thoughts and experiences, so connect with me on my social media channels. I'm most active on LinkedIn and would love for you to join the conversation. Join us next time for more engaging stories, advice, and conversations that matter. Until then, keep striving for excellence and embracing growth. Thank you for listening. Be kind and goodbye from Proteo Conversations.